speakers uh, two or three years ago. He gave an excellent talk. Today's Scott Center 2.0. Two, 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 uh -huh. uh, Scott is an associate professor uh, in industrial engineering, uh, cross point in computer science at the University of Toronto. Uh, and Scott's research is, is very broad. He touches on many areas in AI, from uh, sequential decision making, planning, conversational agents, recommendation systems, applications of machine learning. Uh, he's an associate editor for uh, several uh, journals, the ACM Transactions or Computer Systems, for example, the Machine Learning Journal, a leading one, uh, the Journal of Artificial Intelligence Research, another leading journal. He got several awards from the AI, AI Journal, for example. He was a recipient of the Google Faculty Research Award in 2020, and also as a visiting researcher at Google uh, at 22, uh, 23. Okay, so thanks a lot, Scott, for coming, and the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Fabio. So I'll keep an eye on time. I might have to compress the talk a little bit. Please better work in. I'll be welcome. Thank you for coming. Okay. Okay, first I've discussed the title because I realize no one or a few people do get what it uh, is about. Um, this is a movie reference. Does anyone know the movie reference? So I realize now all my students were not watching movies in 2003 because they weren't born yet. Uh, and all the professors are here as professors because they weren't watching movies. Uh, so the title misses everyone. Has anyone seen it? Terminator T3, Mind of Machines, right? Uh, this is meant to be an epic talk, as you will see, right? And uh, partially a joke and partially not, right? But um, that's what title comes from, if you're wondering. Uh, so let me, let me go back in time to 2002. Um, I, I went to Canada to start, start my PhD at the University of Toronto. Received one critical piece of advice, right, as a first year PhD student. Don't work for Jeff Hinton. <laughs> no one cares about drug number research anymore. It will ruin your career, right? Um, okay, I, I think you might know that was not the best advice. I don't mind putting this up about one of my co faculty members, right, because we all know how this story turned out, right? Uh, other people, like only Suscember, did not take this advice, right? Uh, yeah, graduated with a PhD, co founded with AI, um, uh, released the chat GPT LM asteroid, right, that hit the Earth last November 2022. Right? And, you know, it truly was an asteroid. It really has killed off a lot of previous research. Some problems are now relatively solved. Uh, we don't need to work on them anymore, right? And for the rest of us, it's just changed what we do, it's changed what our students want for sure. Uh, but it's changing what intelligence will look like in the future, right? Whether you want it to or not, it will. Uh, and I'm going to talk about that. So let's fast forward. Um, uh, I had a fortuitous uh, career uh, via Australia, but I made it back to Toronto uh, in 2016. And in 2019, one part about Toronto is it's called there in Lots of Ice for my ankle. <laughs> um, okay, usually this isn't a good talk starter, but this actually leads to good places. Uh, I've been six weeks at home, right? Watch more TV than I've watched before in my life. So we don't watch much TV, but there's always so many hours a day you can work before you give up. Okay. And so I'm looking at Netflix and I'm just facing this swirling infinite wall of movies. You know, uh, apparently it's recommending things to me. I don't know why it's not explaining anything. The search is horrible. I can't really tell what I want. And I just saw, you know, how is it 2019? I can't just give some decent language inputs to the system and tell what I want. I'm just looking for an apocalyptic uh, uh, action movie, the Arnold Schwarzenegger, right? Why can't I tell it? Um, the search is pretty bad. Okay. Anyway, there's a researcher said, I can fix this, right? This is right. No one's working on this. No one's done this, right? This is a huge, huge opportunity, right? And so, I, so I went back to my research group that spring, and I said, everyone, tell me what you're doing, right? Uh, we need to work on conversation recommendation because people will miss this point and it's going to be huge, right? And so I did. Um, I started uh, publishing first in Rex 19 and ever since then. And something happened to me that has never happened to me before after a talk. Typically, I give a talk and Liliana in the audience or Fabian will say, Good talk, Scott. 
<laughs> you know, I'll feel good. You have someone like my work, right? Do they like me or like my work? I'm not sure, but I think they like my work. Uh, anyway, after I gave the talk on conversation recommendation, right? I started having companies come up to me, right? In big companies, like what name? Uh, and multiple, uh, asked me about the work, right? I was like, whoa, I think it's a gold mine. People are interested in my work, you know, more than just my purpose. And this is pretty cool. So, if that's what 2022, I mean, 10 years, and, and I had an opportunity to uh, go on sabbatical somewhere. And uh, I spent part of it with Google Research UK uh, in the conversation recommendation. Um, and this is 2022, uh, around May. And uh, uh, at this point, uh, internal folks at Google can uh, can have an interface and, and like the land is uh, Lambda is sort of pre predated ChatGPT as the uh, you know one of the early learning models trained on dialogue data, which made it much better dialogue than the previous models. And so you know this predated ChatGPT, but it's very much very similar in spirit. And I was like, what? You know, is this thing sentient? Is there someone on the other end of this? Uh, machine typing the answer because I've never seen anything like this before. For anyone who's like chat GPT, you're like, whoa, this is pretty cool. I've not seen a technology like this before. Now I'll point out that I didn't uh I didn't post this to Instagram. <laughs> um, therefore I remained employed. Uh but I mean you know the person who did that uh, you know I was thinking the same thing I was thinking. Um and you know I was thinking like like Everyone can be doing this, right? And I think at that time, Google, you know, they realized they had this technology, but they were concerned that it hallucinates and does things that you can't control. And they were a little bit concerned about, you know, releasing it to the general public. Uh, but, you know, you know, I realized, you know, they had to release steps to the world, but I realized that AI and the world were going to change, right? That this is a technology I had not seen before. Something I would have liked to build myself with someone else built. Okay. And so I had to ask myself, like, okay, how do we get here? Um, you know, if if you're a student, right, if you're a student, right? If, if your supervisor, your student said this, or your student, you said this to your supervisor 10 years ago, I'm gonna train a model pick the next word in a sentence on a lot of data, and it's gonna really solve common sense reasoning. Right, you would have said, you know, go find some supervisor, right? And that's not going to work, right? So we got here somehow. I'm not saying everything's solved, right? But we made great progress, right? Yeah, you know, the way we got here is, is pretty interesting. And we have to be attention to how we got here, right? And furthermore, like, I, mean, I do a lot of natural language recommendations, and my research is certainly going to change. But it turns out I think that a lot more research than that is going to change, right? And it's talking largely about how my research is going to change and how you might want to rethink things that you're doing. Okay. And, you know, I, I, I spent the last year in a state of semi excitement, semi depression, <laughs> trying to figure out my way forward. And I tried to in the talk to steal some of those things. Okay, but first, I would like to have a moment of silence for 2022. Right? <laughs> it is the last year a novel human thought was written down. Um, I don't know about you, but reading my students' texts these days, did you generate this yourself? You know? Uh, anyways. Uh, and we're going to refer to this as the BC era, right? Before Chapter T, right? Uh, 2022. We're now in 2023, and it is now annual college. Uh, and uh, back to my Terminator reference, uh, it's a little bit scary. Right, we have some new LMs taking over, right? There's Bert, and uh, John But wait, there's more, right? Who's missing the multimodal LMs? Oh, uh, yeah. Who is this? Mm -hmm. Four. <laughs> Which is pretty amazing. Pretty darn expensive, but pretty amazing. And I'll show you some examples here. Uh, okay, actually, here it is. Uh, so I've worked on this thing called the abstract reasoning challenge. Uh, it's it basically um, uh, it challenged to ask for AI, right? Take this, uh, give this example, right? This input, this output, right? I'm gonna give you a new input, right? Can you predict what the output will be? This makes this all interactive. Does anyone want to predict what the output will look like? 
Yeah. And you said a cross will be in the middle. The shot to PT said a cross will be in the middle of the two existing objects, right? GPT4, I mean, GPT4 said this, right? Uh, and this is two shot prompting. It's just out of the box, right? Um, and we actually had a, 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 an encoding of the, of the image and text, right? It says, here's the output image, right? Here's what it looks like. The two ob uh, you know, the three objects, here's a gorgeous the color of the size, right? Actually tells you also as well, because this was in a prompt to say this, here are the transformation steps in English, right? Uh, right? This is what happened. And it's correct, right? You know, if you didn't have a lot of benchmark disposal and you told your student to produce this tool, right? How long would it take to do it? Right? Um, this is pretty impressive. Uh, the fact that even identify that there's a cross shape, right? Uh, just from the, the text. Okay, this is GPT-4, right? Uh, it's pretty amazing. It has sort of image and language understanding. Uh, and so, you know, we're, you know, we're in a new world, right? Uh, if you don't recognize, this is me right here. Uh, I, uh, in, in my apocalyptic movie uh, theme, uh, here's another one. Uh, and uh, I, don't, I don't wear this banner on my belt today, but I usually have it on me. Um, anyways, uh, Mad Max is shot in Australia. Uh, I spent my, the rest of my spell last year in Australia as well. This is my son. Uh, the landscape's similar, right? Uh, but, you know, it's a new world for us and our children, right? It'll affect our research for sure. Our children, right, are going to have these intelligent educational tutors, right, that are probably comparable to some teachers. Not the best teachers for sure, but, you know, compared to a classroom with 30 students where no students get any attention, right, these language models can give very intelligent feedback on their writing, right, on their reasoning, right? They're going to grow up with these tools, right? It's going to change their world. Some jobs that they would have gotten previously, you know, are now going to be offloaded to large language models. Um, and other jobs will be, will, will be created, right? So it really is a new world. Okay, so the AI now, AI now has moved, right? I think it's important for all of us to recalibrate what's easy and what's hard, right? And also consider how we approach AI. It doesn't change everything, but I think it changes a lot. Okay. So I started this off by talking about you know, my interest in conversation recommendation, realizing this was going to change my work for sure. I work with natural language interfaces. And so let me tell you about some insights I've, I've got from this perspective. Okay. And just, yeah, I think everyone knows this, but just to be sure we're all on the same page, let me just very quickly say what the generative LLM is trying to do. Right? So we take a super large uh, uh, neural network uh, in the form of uh, what's called a transformer, right? And we just give it uh, text input and we say, here's second law of robotics, this is Isaac Asimov, right? Fill in the next words. Okay? Here's the next prefix, fill in the next word. Right? All it's doing, all it's training on is predict the next word, uh, give the prefix, right? And we have terabytes and terabytes of text to train this on. It's your LLM. It models language. What's going to come next? Okay. So let me just then briefly discuss ways that we use large language models. Okay. So I'm going to, I'm going to give examples in the context of recommendation. So if I'm recommending you to something, if I'm recommending, say, a movie to you, right? Uh, I could, I could, I could give it this input. If I like Planet of the Apes, Terminator T3, right, then I would also like, and you leave the ending blank, right? You have the model generate what would fill that in, right? And it will. It'll fill in movies that are actually quite related, right, to these ones that you put in because it's been trained on a lot of movie data and a lot of movie review data. Okay. Um, so that's zero shot. I could also do few shot training where I provide a few examples to help sort of prime the way to approach this problem, right? So I can say if I like Shrek, Toy Story, and I would also like Rio, right? These are animations, right? If I like Zoolander, Comic Thunder, I would also like Meet the Parents. These have been still around, right? If I like Pen of the Apes, Terminator T3, and I would also like, right? Have the system fill in the rest of the problem. Okay. And finally, right? I don't you know for, for recommendation. I don't have to just give it movie names. I can say instead, you know, in 
in my, what I like to do for, for competition work, recommendation is say, if I like apocalyptic science fiction movies, right, then I would like, here I give a description and have it fill in the result. Okay. And so there, there, there are two things that you can do. You can either have the large language model generate, right, uh, as free text what fills in uh, the movie uh, tag here, uh, or you can actually provide uh, a sequence of tokens and then have it score the long likelihood of those tokens under the language model. Uh, in fact, the latter tends to work better. That's what we did. This, this is work that I did at Google. It's now published. Uh, and you know, the question is, can LLMs using this sort of prompting, right? using this sort of prompting, can they do, um, can can they do uh, recommendation? And I want to point out here, we call this few shot right, because we give examples, right, to help it understand sort of what it's doing. Uh, this up here is some zero shot, right? Uh, we don't give any examples. Just, uh, Tecla Rasa, I like this, but I also like something else. And the results were pretty impressive. Right? Here we use Palm. Palm, uh, I think, uh, I don't know the full details, but I believe Bard, uh, which may be the public uh, tool you hear about from Google, Bard was derived from Palm. But these are experiments in Palm. Um, and what we found out is that with Palm, zero shot, large image models, uh, right, no, no examples whatsoever, right? Match the state of the art uh, recommendation methods that were trained, there were supervised methods trained on 10 to the 7th labeled examples. Right? You can train on 10 million examples, a custom architecture, you can just pop large image models in English. You can do the same. It's really annoying for people to do recommendation. Right? Um, now, in this case, the LM did no movies, right? There are the domains where you won't have trained on the data, and that's a little bit different. And I'll, I'll get to how you handle those domains uh, in a minute. You, you can go out of the training data. Okay. Yeah, the cool thing is these weren't trained to do recommendation, right? Now, I took this out of the slide because I just don't have time to talk about it, but it's really interesting. Uh, the biases that you, we used to get from the supervised data have gone away, but now we get a new, lot, lots of new language biases that come in, right? So it's interesting, you know, we're getting good performance, but we've really shifted the bias. It's not like we've gotten rid of bias, we've actually shifted the bias. I'm happy to talk about that offline afterwards if you want to discuss that. Um, okay, another side, side point I, I, I wanted to, this is pretty cool, right? Uh, we did as well recommending from items history, right? Uh, I like these three movies, as we did from uh, natural language as the input, right? And this is great for conversation recommendation. I can really tell what I want in terms of language, and it will, it will figure it out. Now, you might ask, like, like, why does this work? How can a zero shot model not train for this task do as well as a supervised model train for the task, right? It all comes with the evolution of large language models. Okay. So, um, what I'm showing here, this is a fictitious graph, but this is basically what uh, I'm seeing from my work. Uh, on the x axis, we have the size of the pre trained model, right? So, if you have, if, if uh, and this is, sorry, I should clarify, this is the amount of data that goes into pre training. There we go. No, sorry. This is, this is the size and the number of parameters of the pre-trained model, right? Uh, so you have no pre-trained model at all, right? You can have a model around the size of BERT. You can have a model around the size of GPT-4 here uh, at the extreme. Okay. And if you have zero data, uh, in a, you know, if you if you do zero pre-training, right? If you don't use any pre-training. Uh, then you're going to need a bunch of supervised examples to train for your task because you have no pre-training. Um, so that's supervised learning, right? But if you start to have a language model, right, of a certain size, uh, you can start to fine-tune that model with less than 10 million examples, right? Uh, maybe 100,000, maybe 10,000. Right? The more you pre-train, uh, the less fine-tuning data that you need. Uh, once you sort of hit the size of the BERT model, the 7, 7 billion parameter, so what are these? Uh, that's, that's a billion, yeah. So, so once you're in the billion range, right, this is where you start to be able to do sort of the few shot learning, right, a few examples, and that's enough to, to, to generalize from. By the time you hit the really large language models, right, zero shot, no supervised data, it all works, right? It has seen so much data, so many tasks implicitly in the data. Right, at this point, if you just give instructions, you know what I want you to do, it knows how to do it, right? But this is, this is what we're seeing, right? Once the model gets large enough, right, and as of 
uh, ChatGPT, right, and, and, and the GPT uh, size models, right, we can do pretty amazing things with three and five examples or even zero shot, no examples. And that's what we saw. Like Paul, no examples, we're doing as well recommendation. This was an eye opening, right? Um, but there's a good story here. Right? We're now in this regime. Okay, so I want to say like, like the world's knowledge is largely in written down in text. Uh, it's written down on the web. It's written in books. It's written in scientific papers, right? And previously, if you worked with text as a machine learner, you would have said bag of words, right? Take your document, mix everything up, shake it up, right? You have bag of words. Uh, you know you can do document dog classification from that, but you really can't understand much, right? Then we have sequential models. And now we have sequential models and steroids. Um, and these make the world's knowledge in text now accessible. We can understand that text in ways that we couldn't do before. Right? Um, you know? So you know, we can find semantically related text, right? You know, 10 years ago we had decent word embeddings, right? But now the prompts really unlock, unlock complex reasoning, right, and the knowledge in text. Um, and you know, you might ask, why can large language models reason? I mean, it's sort of an information theoretic argument, but uh, uh, if you just train on enough data, right, to predict the next line of code in Python, to predict the next uh, uh, math token in a scientific paper, we would argue requires reasoning. That's what we do, right? And these models, right, can accurately predict those next. Uh, the next line of code, or the or the next symbol of math, right in the equation, uh, they must understand something. And I don't use the word loosely, right, uh, in order to predict that next uh, that next token, right. And so, is it just the amount of data you're having? The fact that you train this long enough, it's just progressing the world's knowledge in a way that generalizes, right. And then also, I want to point out that attention, right, attention is incredibly useful. This is a hard lesson I've learned in the past year. So. You know, for one for one recognition example in the recipe, in sort of in, in recipe and food recognition, we were looking at queries like this. I like meat lasagna when I'm watching my weight, right? Historically, we couldn't really work with phrases like watching my weight because it was hard to interpret what that meant, right? But if you look at what uh, GPT will do with this, right, uh, or a large language model, even like Burke will do, um, uh, it, it will start to reason that beef lasagna, right, satisfies meat lasagna, right? And the combination of whole wheat, low-fat, and part skin, right, are appropriate for someone who is watching their weight. And if you look at the attention uh, in these transformers, right, you'll, you'll see the focus of these query words on these words in the retrieval, right? It really is uh, focusing the attention in the right place, right? Previously, what you may have done is you may have taken an embedding of the query, an embedding of the retrieval item, taken a dot product, right? But when you do the embedding, right, you get 35% actually matching. When you do prompting, you go up to 86%, right? Why 86%? Because we're really leveraging the attention in the language model. And that, that's, a, that's a lesson that I've learned in the past year. Now, I apologize if you're asking what is attention. I don't have a whole, uh, whole lot of time to give you a uh, background on that. But I will say, you can, you can investigate what these language models are doing, and you can see that these words here are paid attention. Meat lasagna pays attention to meat lasagna. And you can see that Watch My Way pays attention to these other words. You can actually read all the attention in the inference. And it gets you, I mean, in machine learning, if you get like one or two percent, historically you can publish a paper. I've never ever had a 51% jump, right, overnight. Okay, so I don't mean to upset logicians. I did my uh, master's degree in logic. I realized I wasn't a really great logician, so I moved on. Uh, but um, I don't mean to upset people, but I, I do. You know, at least for general AI, I do think we need to rethink logic a bit, what logic we're using, right? And you're seeing a lot of people in the literature now using natural language as sort of this uh, representation for logical reasoning. And I understand there are plenty of problems with that, right? But it is doing some pretty impressive things as well. And I, I want to ask especially, right, or I want to point out especially, that we can sit in the art common sense reasoning, right, uh, without any ontology and axiom when we use language models. Um, and, I, and I want to ask, I mean, you know, um, the Psych Project, right, was trying to formalize common sense reasoning higher over the last 40 years, right? These common sense reasoning tools, right, are not Psych, right? 
Uh, maybe it was the wrong project, maybe they made, they made mistakes, I'm not sure, right? But large language models got us a decent common sense reasoning. Um, you know, including this example, but many, many, many more complex examples that require sort of really knowledge of uh, the world, right? And so, you know, I, we do need to rethink what is our representation, right? What are our mechanisms? I still love a theorem prover, right, in terms of being able to verify something's true. Uh, but what I've realized is that large language models are very good for surfacing the axioms, you know, that 40 years couldn't encode manually, right? So I think there are nice ways to use our old tools uh, with these systems to extract axioms that we didn't know to write down. Okay. Uh, and I want to talk about building systems with, uh, building whole conversational recognition systems with large language models. Uh, because I had five interns this summer in 12 weeks build a system which made colleagues in a very large company say, that's cool, we can't do that yet. Five hundred interns, 12 weeks to do this, right? Using language models in the right way. How? Okay. So let's, let, let's think of recommendation, right, as a discussion, as an interaction, as a chat, right? Can ChatGPT do recommendation? So I say ChatGPT, you can type this in yourself, I have some Japanese food. They'll say, yeah, so here's some restaurants you might enjoy, right? Here's one in New York, here's one in Tokyo, here's one in London. If money is no object, just get your first class ticket there and enjoy this lovely, lovely sushi, right? So, I mean, ChatGPT doesn't really understand the context of recommendation, right? Um, and so, you know, out of the box, these, these, these problems aren't solved. And so, we're looking at sort of ChatGPT at one end, sort of being completely unstructured, just have it solve the problem itself, right? That doesn't quite work, right? Um, it doesn't, doesn't understand context. At the other end, right, if you w use Google Assistant or Siri or Alexa, right, as of six months ago, probably, these tools are fairly template-based and fairly, fairly rigid in how they interact with I mean, I, I, I can only imagine that all the companies are uh, reworking their entire uh, conversational system architectures based on LLMs now. But six, 12 months ago, right, they were, they were pretty inflexible and pretty rigid, right? Uh, and, you know, you, you, you ask a question, right, and then you ask another question, it's already forgotten what you said the first time, right? These are what we deal with with today's assistants, right? So, so you know, hopefully some middle ground, right, uh, where we can sort of leverage the intelligence of long, large language models, but, you know, still have some structured conversation. Okay. And what I like about this is we have an architecture you know, we can see what's doing, we can see the state, we can debug it, right? You can't, ChatGPT goes wrong, you can't debug it, right? So I, I, I sort of like this middle ground. These architectures that sit on top of the, the, the models. Okay. Um, now this will be in the recording. If you want to come back, we have a, we have a system that runs in CoLab uh, that allow you to demo the system, it actually works, uh, and this will be in the video uh, when you look at it. Okay. Um, so let's, let's, let's say how uh, we would build a computational system with a large language model. Okay. Remember, previously I've actually been prompting, right? You, you get some input and you say, well, what's, what's the right output, right? So we take a user input, right? And we have to know what, what the intent's were. Were they asking for a recommendation? Were they giving us a preference? Uh, were, they, were, they, were they asking a question about a previous recommendation, right? You need to do intent classification uh, for what was the input. And you know, the intents are actually, users tend to actually say lots in their input, so there's actually usually multiple intents. Um, and we do this with props, right? My students got the program in English all summer, right? It was kind of scary, but it worked, right? Uh, we, gave, we gave a few examples of intents, and then we would then be able to generalize, sorry, uh, to classify the intent correctly. Okay. Uh, next, you've got the intent, right? Now, try to update the state uh, based on the utterance uh, and the intent, and again, that was prompt-based, and our state was JSON, right? So the beauty of training large language models and so much Python code and so much code in general is that they have seen a lot of JSON, right? Uh, so you have this sort of key value pair uh, storage, and we would say, here's the current state of the user, you know, uh, they're, in the, they're in Toronto, they want Italian, um, there's some soft constraints for romantic and cozy atmosphere, right? Now, given the, given the language input, update the JSON, and it would do it, right? It would figure out uh, whether it's a hard or soft constraint and so on. We give two-shot examples, but it would do it, 
In fact, you know, in our code base, which is open source, you can see it. You can see all the prompts that we used and their structure. Okay. So now we have a state as JSON. Now we say, okay, what should the recommender do? Right? It's going to respond to the user. Right? This is called action, action classification. Right? Should you recommend? Should we answer a question? Etc. Right? That again is prompt based. And then actually turning uh, the content, um, it, it turning the action into a natural language response, even explaining why you recommend something, right? That's done with a prompt, right? Actually, sorry, the, uh, uh, that's a prompt, and in fact, uh, here, if you know it, we're using retrieval augmented techniques uh, to leverage the world's reviews, right, to help answer the user's queries, right? Again, I said, large language models are, large language models are now unlocking all the knowledge in text we're now recommending from review stores, right? We have millions, right? Tens of millions of reviews, right? We're trying to match what the user wants uh, to those reviews and then asking large language model to generate the response. Okay. Right? And you do this, right? Five interns, 12 weeks, they're undergrads, build the system. And here's the interaction you can get, right? Like some Japanese food for now being with the kids, right? Now, this will say, right? Can you find the location? Because that's Pretty important recommendation. So we say Jeff for Avenue. Okay. And the system will respond. Okay. How about checking out? I don't say for, for Japanese cuisine. It's great for families and has a casual yet fancy vibe, right? I said now to get the kids. It realizes this is great for families, right? It's explained to me why from the reviews it thinks it's relevant, right? And then it gives me more options as well, right? That have uh, excellent customer reviews. Okay. Uh, this is a large range model doing everything, right? If I had to build this two years ago with the world's best postdocs, I could not have done it, right? Uh, now, uh, five really, really sharp and hardworking undergrad interns, right, large, large language models, allow me to build this, right? Again, you know, we talked to one company who were like, yeah, we actually can't do that yet. This is cool. Um, but they were very glad we open sourced this. Uh, okay. So my, my question is, how does this part work here, right? We use the query. And we do dense retrieval against the reviews for restaurants that are within the vicinity of location, right? And, and dense retrieval is very good. Right? Neural retrieval is very good at matching these phrases, not even the kids, to right, for families and other stuff mentioned the reviews. So that service is relevant reviews and the restaurants. And then we have the large language model reason about the reviews, rank the options, and even given the explanation, right? It's all done with prompting. We're programming in English now. It's upsetting, but it's pretty cool. Okay, and I want to say, like, I mean, based on this, I think the future of with LLMs is only limited by your creativity, right? There are going to be uses of LLMs next year that we hadn't thought of this year. We're saying, oh wow, I wish I had thought of that, right? Uh, and I see a lot of papers on LLMs cannot do X, right? And I want to know these papers have a half life of about six months, right? Because the community, and I think these papers should be written. I'm not saying don't write them. Uh, large language models get a lot wrong, right? But the community takes these as a challenge, right? And in six months, you know, some enterprising group is going to address that challenge. Say, no, that they now solve X, right? Okay. So, you know, I, large language models and prompting, talking to your machine in English really democratizes AI. Previously, you had to hire someone who was trained in AI and machine learning uh, to do AI, right? That's how I got a lot of funding. Uh, it's changing now. Anyone who can speak English, right, or any language that ChatGPT understands uh, can build AI technologies, exactly as my interns did this summer, right? They haven't taken their AI course yet. They didn't need to. It was very intuitive for them, right? This really democratizes access to AI, which I think is brilliant. Right? Uh, you know, we use, to, we use to train models, we fine tune them, right? Then we soft prompt tune them. That was when I got you know, to Google initially, that's what they were doing, soft prompt tuning, right? But now we're just not even, not, not even fine tuning, right? We're uh, just speaking them in English, right? Or some other language, again, that chat to where the LMs understand, right? And this really opens up the technology to, to everyone. Okay. Um, Previously, if you would asked me two years ago what's important about deep learning, I would have said embeddings, right? And I'm not talking about embeddings today. So you might ask for embeddings then. Well, no, I mean, they're still quite critical for how these systems work. Uh, but you know, now with the attention mechanism 
uh, and prompting, right? We don't really need to think about the embeddings anymore. They're just sort of under the hood. Some people do, but it's not, it's not as important as it was before. Uh, and I, 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 I want to point this out, right? Um, years ago, uh, when I was at uh, Nickton, Australia, we were building sentiment, uh, uh, sentiment classification models, right? That was a huge uh, in industry at that time. And I, I, I remember a funder who was very upset that our Senate class, classifier could not understand sarcasm, you know? And we're like, come on, like, you know, seriously. Like, you saw that, you saw all of AI. Um, and, and, and the, um, you know, like, come on. Like, this is a hard problem. This requires reasoning and understanding. And, yeah, 2023, right, just tell your sentiment model, detect sarcasm, right? It'll do it, and it works. It's really upsetting. But we have to realize the world's changed, right? We, we can now just tell our model what to, to, what, what to do, and the big models can do that. Okay. And I find, actually, my undergrads are better this summer prompting than I was, because they're used to talking, thinking about the machine as a human, right? For me, working many years in very formal languages, it's very hard for me to think about doing this, right? It's easier for our students often to do this than it is for, for the, older, the older researchers. Okay. Okay, so I think I'm going to cover yours. I'm not going to run out of time. Um, uh, so what's, how did we get to these really intelligent systems that can uh, do all this zero-shot reasoning? Um, it turns out that having high-quality, diverse data is critical. At some point, with training large language models, they realized it wasn't about making the models larger. It was about the data you gave the models. So I'll get there in a second. Um, I want to. I, I, I like this quote. And I don't know who to, to attribute it to. If you find out who to attribute this to, let me know. Uh, but the quote is: For the first 50 years, we programmed our computers to do a task, right? And for the next 50 years, we're going to train them, right, and instruct them to do a task, right? That's scary. Um, and there's been some amazing work on having large language models generate programs, right? And when the programs have bugs on test cases. Then you give them the prompt that says, here's your program. Uh, here's the bug report. Please fix it. And the next output is a debug program. Right? This actually works. There are papers about this. Uh, Voyager, I think, is one of the key uh, methods in this area. Right? Um, these systems can just debug themselves right, with their outputs. Okay? And so really, programming is really the exercise of curating and synthesizing right, the examples of the task, right, the, the curriculum. Uh, think of what Tesla's doing now with autonomous driving, right? Uh, they're switching to a transform model that predicts the driver's next action based on this rich multimodal uh, uh, history of the driver's previous actions. Now, what's kind of cool about this is that uh, well, one caveat of, of this model is that now these Teslas running these uh, uh, algorithms are, are doing rolling stops, right? Because they're trained on human data, right? And they're going to do what humans do. They are way better driving but they also recreate, you know, uh, human uh, violation of laws, right? So that's interesting. But as an example of, we're not programming the pro system, right, to drive, right, which I think was initially the, the, the settings were engineered, right? We're now actually just giving them the data, right, uh, to learn how to drive. Um, this is pretty cool, right? Uh, so it turns out that when you're training an LLM, uh, you, you don't get much, so for very large LLMs uh, trained on terabytes of data, you don't get much change after an epic or two of training, which kind of means that, uh, that um, they've sort of gotten everything they need out of the data uh, in the first few passes, right? And so if you're not going to iterate over data a lot uh, to improve, then you just need to improve the diversity of the data, right? And so a lot of LLMs, if LLMs improved a lot, right? Uh, with non-redundant data, it doesn't help, right? Diverse data, mixture of content types, right? There's a lot more Python and scientific papers in the training mix now, and that really helped the reasoning capabilities. In, in, you know, in using more Python in the training data helped non-Python reasoning, right? You're getting this sort of generalization across tasks, right? And the quality data is critical. There, you know, any, any pipeline now has lots of classifiers to try to detect and get rid of low quality data. This is pretty cool, right? You have Python papers, about their content, and then you improve reasoning in common sense in other domains, right? So, point is, going forward, 
the data may be the most important thing you do. What you curate for your task is most important. I work with a lot of companies, and they work with, um, uh, they subcontract a company called snorkel.ai. Do you know what snorkel.ai does? I'm not intending to get free advertising, but I am. They basically generate a lot of data, a lot of sometimes synthetic data, a lot of augmented data. They generate data, that's what they do, right? So you, know, you say, I read the task, you pay them to generate data, they give you data, you train a model, voila, right? It's more about the data than anything else. I don't like that, but <laughs> it's how, you know, you know, we're now teachers, right? And we're giving our students the right examples. Um, So data is going synthetic, right? I used to say, I mean, I, I never believed this would work previously, right? I said, if you generate synthetic data, you're never going to do better than the system that generated the data to begin with, right? You're never going to go outside of the, the rules that generate the data. Well, these systems generalize so well that actually they are generalizing beyond the synthetic data. So it's pretty amazing. Um, let's okay. And beyond the training, right, the synthetic data, right, so I do use, use, use studies on occasion with computational re recommendation. They're quite painful. Uh, you have to have humans evaluate a lot of the output, right? And what we can do now, what a lot of companies are doing now, is using large language models to evaluate, uh, to, to do the evaluation, right? And, and I will say, like, is a large language model better than your best human? No. But if you've crowdsourced judgments, right, you'll know a lot of your crowdsourced workers are trying their best to do something that looks like the task, but isn't really, you know, they're, they're, they're trying to get paid, right, uh, but they're not really trying to help you out, right? And so when you're, when you're in a system like that where you can't rely on a lot of what you're paying for, uh, and a lot of it turns out to unfortunately be low quality, uh, then the large language model, right, on average is doing better, right, than that, those crowdsourced judgments. Um, and that's scary. Again, not as, bad, not as good as best humans, right? But you don't often get those in, in crowdsourcing. OK, I want to talk about some myths with large language models. Um, that the information needs to be in the large language model training data, right? It's not true. That's why we have retrieval augmented methods, right? Uh, if we can retrieve the relevant context for what we're doing, uh, in, in content, and put that in the context window of the input, right, then we can leverage it. And you know, LMs cannot reason about X. Um, they can't do certain types of logical reasoning and so on. Well, you know what? I mean, I, I don't think the LMs should do everything, right? You can use reasoning augmented language models. And it's interesting, this, this goes in two directions. The language models can consult APIs for good reasoners. They just formalize the input, the input and let the reasoner do the, do, do the formal inference. And I think that's a great idea, especially for, for verifiable inference. Right? Um, but the reasoners can also, I said before, we couldn't formalize all common sense knowledge, right, higher logic. Uh, you just can't, just can't write it down in 40 years. But now you can have your logical reasoner query the language model. Do you think this axiom, right? You're doing that Do you think this axiom holds true? Right? And it'll say yes or no, right? And so you can use it to surface axioms that you, you, you might need. So for reasoning, I think we really need to look at these hybrid models, right? with systems calling it LLMs and LLMs calling systems, right? Uh, that's where I think we get the most benefit. Okay, so you know, initially I was thinking, oh, it's Meyer Research versus LLMs, right? And that's not the case, right? This is a great tool, how do we use it? How do we, how do we build hybrid systems that do even better than anything we had before? That, that's the question, right? Okay. Um, I believe architectures for AI, therefore, are going to be a huge uh, research area going forward. I, I just want to say very, uh, at the end here, what's really cool, machine learning, NLP, IR, vision, reasoning, robotics, right? The silos between all these fields are breaking down, right? Uh, these used to be independent fields of their own methodologies. They're all getting mixed together now. They're all working together. And that's pretty cool, right? We're now doing a body and AI is working, and all these systems are, are working together. That makes, that, makes, that makes me very happy. Okay. And I will also want to say that now that our systems are interactive, right, you should make some friends in HCI, right? Uh, we now need to evaluate systems outside of our uh, laptop, 
right? We need to evaluate them with the users who we're going to serve. Okay. Yeah. I mean, two slides left. Um, so some things we've lost, we need to add back, right? Uh, we've lost good reasoning about uncertainty, right? Large language models are notoriously, notoriously very confident about things that are incorrect, right? That's a problem, right? We've lost uncertainty, we need to get that back in, right? I don't have time to discuss that, but it's a huge uh, research challenge, right? Uh, they can't reason about risk, right? Uh, they'll give you advice sometimes, medical advice, they probably shouldn't give you. I, I mean, I think of AI now just try very hard to put guardrails on the system, but, you know, the raw system does lots of things, doesn't reason about what it's saying in ways that it should. Right. You know, uh, we have problems with factuality, we have problems with hallucination, right? We need to improve that. Right. It's a lot of work on that, obviously. We need to attribute our sources. Um, that's part of being factual, right? I believe this, here's my source that tells me this. And that's important because one thing large language models don't really understand is that a lot of the world's data is subjective. Um, if I ask you whether Terminator T3 is a good movie, right, or maybe if I ask you whether Dumb and Dumber or uh, The Lobster, if you've seen it, is a good movie, right, you're going to get a lot of subjective variation, right? People will love it, people will hate it. And, you know, large language models, are, you know, they seem to have a model of the world, right? They don't really understand that there's lots of individual variation, right? So, you know, this the fact that Queen Elizabeth is crowned in 52 is objective, right? The fact that Lobster is a great movie is subjective, right? Truly. <laughs> very, very diverse opinion on this topic. But, um, and uh, uh, the fact that Joe Biden won the 2020 US presidential election, right? If you go on the web, depending on the resource you look at, this is apparently subjective, right? Um, you know, but you don't want to get it wrong. You know, you should say that Here's the answer, right? There are different opinions. 97%, I can say too much here, of, <laughs> you know, uh, of the text says, you know, this is true, but 3% disagrees. I'm being recorded, I shouldn't say too much. <laughs> um, okay, so, but we, we, but we need to be aware of this and we need to service this when it's relevant, right? There are differences of opinion, understand what the differences are, make your own decisions, right? Give the user agency. We don't need to tell people what to do, but we need to make them aware of, of uh, what's out there. Okay? Um, and again, I want to come back to we need high level architectures, right, to maintain task oriented employee control, right, to deal with these sorts of issues and others. Okay, so final slide, right? Uh, you know, we're in a brave, right? We're in a new world, the gender AI economy, and something more specifically a brave new world, right? Uh, not everything gets better, right? Some things we have to be concerned about. Uh, but overall, I'm optimistic, right? My, my research career has changed in the last year, and we can do things that I never thought I could do before. So I'm mostly optimistic. The job market's going to change, right? Apparently, game, gaming companies are laying off artists. I have a colleague who's a business person who is very happy he just laid off 100 contractors. Uh, who do customer service email responses because large language models do just as well, right? Uh, he was very happy. I don't know that his employees uh, were, uh, but he's replaced them with large language models, right? This is happening, um, right? Our kids will think of Python, right? Like we think of punch cards. Um, oh, you got to do that to get typed out? Oh, the syntax? What does that mean? <laughs> right? Um, there will be a new ecosystem of advanced interactive systems and jobs go with them. I mean, I think we're pushing uh, jobs in the future into the more creative class, right? The higher level stuff that, you know, these systems can't do yet. Uh, they can grammatically correct text, that's no problem, right? But can they architect systems, reason about climate change and so on? No, right? I mean, you know, there, there's, these are parts where humans come in, right? And interestingly, uh, data scientists is a hot topic for a job, right, historically, in the last 10 years. Going forward, I think data synthesis is going to be one of the hottest jobs, right? Because that's where I see a lot of data going. It's synthetic. It annoys me that this works, but it does. Um, right? I do think we should be willing to forget everything we know, right? Um, you know, we should be willing to, right? I'm not saying we should forget, but we should be willing to forget, right? I mean, our students have a problem with this, right? It's pre-2022, they already think it's outdated, right? Like, oh, you dinosaur, you know, they don't do it this way anymore. 
you kids. <laughs> um, right? But I think we have a lot to buy about how we approach problems, and we need to sort of try to drop those temporarily and look at how people are doing things today, right, who don't have those biases, because they're making lots of progress. And I do believe the future of these AI architectures is a mix of the old, the formal, the traditional, and the new. But the underlying representations are changing. We have to say, how does all of our previous formal work look with these new representations? When natural language and image is our representation, right? Good question. Okay. You know, and now I want to point out that previously language models, you know, previously in AI, we were very good at solving well-formalized problems. But now these language models can actually take text and formalize problems. You can tell them, oh, you made this mistake. You say, oh, I love this part now. I'll add it back in, right? Uh, we, we can now formalize problems in context. And that's pretty powerful. That is, that's, that's a link to body AI. Okay. So we now have incredible new opportunities, right? especially in user-facing settings. Right? Proposition interacts with everything. That's going to change. Right? Educational tutoring, I think I, I would if there weren't already a thousand companies doing this with LLMs, I would do it, but you know, there are already enough companies uh, doing this. Uh, robotics, right, is really changing in what it can do and interact with. Um, right, and biomed, right, I, I, uh, I believe the transformers are going to crack meaning, the sequential meaning of, the, uh, of DNA, right, in ways that we haven't done before, right? And I think with that last uh, uh, innovation, right, uh, I hope to uh, live a long time and see you all here in 2073. <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay, all right, so we have uh, time for some questions. Uh, before I think about some questions. So, uh, so. Um, maybe, maybe you can use the microphone so that yeah. people in the internet can uh, hear you. Um, we will never have information about everything. So how do you deal with uh, something like, uh, uh, well, what's the right uh, fertilizer for me to grow pineapples in a bucket in the ceiling of my institute? <laughs> <laughs> well, I would, I would argue the components that, I mean, either we don't know, right, and we need a lot of... know that it doesn't know, does it have this? Well, okay, so that's a good point. I mean, we need, uh, people are working on this, right? I mean, it, it's probably... Uh, for um, uh, being in Google uh, to say, I don't know when there's no, they don't think there's any relevant information. You don't want to hallucinate the answer. But, you know, I would argue probably some of the components to, of, of, of this information to answer, the, answer that question, right, are out there, right? You've got a roof, right, in Sao Paulo, right? What's the climate there? Uh, uh, what do pineapples need for fertilizer? You know? I believe the components of knowledge and those questions are out there, and you need to chain them together with lots of reasoning, right, and get it right. But uh, you know, I do believe. Now I don't. You're absolutely right. We cannot answer that question today because of the because of the need to compose all the information from different sources. But I assure you, there are at least a hundred people, right, actively working on that task, and there will be more. And you know, ask that question in five years to GPT-6, and see what you get. The area is so data driven. What would you recommend to someone that wants to research and I'll be on a lower source language? Okay. How do you? Uh, what would you? Um, what would you advise someone working on low resource languages? Uh, uh, you need data, right? Um, yeah. I mean, I, I, if you're going to use anything I mentioned here today, you're going to need data. Um, uh, the beauty, right back to my initial slide, was that when you have, you know, terabytes and terabytes, terabytes of data, very large models, right? There are patterns, right, of reasoning in the world that generalize across languages, right? So you can hope now that you don't need as much data, right? Uh, but uh, but you will need some, right? Uh, 
you know, as long as you've got people to talk to, right, you can generate that data. Um, you know, could, could 100 transcripts be enough? You know, given the trends that we're seeing, I, I, I don't know the answer right now, uh, but given the trends we're seeing and the generalization abilities, maybe it is enough, right, um, uh, to, to leverage that. But for any, any settings, you're going to need data, right? Um, you know, either I, the other option is a more model-based sort of reasoner, right? But I would say, you know, model-based folks have, you know, worked for 30, 40, 50 years, uh, and we have the tools we have today, right? They'll keep improving, but what's the best way forward, right? Keep improving those tools, uh, or to just collect data where it doesn't exist. Um, you know, if you, if I had to bet, you know, I'd say collect data where it doesn't exist. Actually, we have a bunch of questions from the internet uh, viewers, but let me ask one first, my, my own question. Please. So one thing you didn't mention or didn't discuss was the energy efficiency of these models. So these are models that take a lot of uh, energy to run. They are very big, they require data centers. Wouldn't it be the case that just for those considerations, it would be nice to have uh, more knowledge representative um, maybe explicitly so that they can think about the knowledge that can be smaller. Do you think they could be smaller? Because like GPT-4 is a giant. Do you think we should look, look into smaller models or is it possible at all? Okay, it, it, it's a great question. There are, there are two answers there. I mean, obviously, you look at the history of computation, right? Look at the UNIVAC and these massive systems that took up entire rooms. Right? There's quotes from people saying, well, we need three computers you know, for the, to serve the whole world. Uh, because they are so large, they couldn't imagine having more. Um, so uh, there will be miniaturization and improvements in efficiency and distillation that perform just as well. Uh, I obviously, a lot of parameters aren't actually actively being used. Right? Um, and so and for the companies who want to save money, right, you're, you're ne necessarily going to see uh, improvements in the size of these models. Right? And, and, and distilling them and, and compressing them. Uh, but the second answer is, you know, I, I, I showed you a, um, a uh, interactive co co conversation recommender that was driven uh, by prompting, right? And my students in 12 weeks could do prompting for every decision that was being made in the system, right? But prompting is expensive, right? And I actually spent quite a bit of money, right, supporting those students over the, over the summer for, my, for the GPT a API expenses, right? But for all those decisions, for the most part, we can replace them with fine-tuned models that are much smaller, right? So again, you know, in my, in my, in my early slide, I said, you know, the, the larger the model, the less fine-tuned data you need. But if it's a task that you're going to deploy to a billion people, well, go ahead and collect the data and fine-tune, and then you can work with a much smaller model, right? So I'm willing to bet in the future that we can work with some billion parameter models, right, that are 100, 1,000 times more efficient, as long as we're willing to train them, right? Just a matter of prompting works zero shot, you know, the next minute, right? And if you want to deploy something that's lower cost, you're going to have to fine tune like data. So I think you're already seeing a trade off in companies, right? If, if they care enough, they're going to distill it down to smaller special purpose model. Okay. Maybe we can take a look at uh, maybe uh, two questions just to finish as we uh, will have a coffee uh, after the, the talk. Um, there are several questions uh, from the online viewers. Let me start with this one, which I think is around your uh, topics that you've been working on uh, for many years. Uh, Scott, do you feel work in planning, reasoning in planning, uh, planning under certainty, feel uh, fit uh, in this uh, after ChatGPT world? So that's one question you could uh, maybe address. And then there's this other question, which is sort of a the end of the galaxy question, right? So, how do you evaluate the current public debate on the existential risks of technologies related to LLM? I guess if you could address those two, and I'll ask the other uh, uh, viewers and, and questions to to um, send my by email. Maybe we can address them later. But maybe you can talk about those. Okay, I'm, I'm going to take the hardest question first: uh, the existential risk of technologies related to LLM. Uh, someone should be debating this, and it is not me, <laughs> right? Uh, I, I think I really want to build really great restaurant movie, 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 and movie recommenders for you, and I want to make a lot of money on that startup. 
Um, and uh, I really can't say that uh, I'm a, the right type to comment on that question, right? Uh, there are players based online who are gonna have way better answers than I can give. Uh, so I'm gonna defer there, I apologize. Um, uh, but for that, okay, for something that's much closer to something I, I can answer, right? Planning and reasoning un, 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 under uncertainty. Uh, there are two, two answers there. Uh, one is that, um, uh, you know, currently to use planning, planning technologies, you need experts. You need, you need to hire me or Liliani or Fabio or someone else, right, to be the interface, right, between your problem and the technologies, right? And now the large language models, right, can, can automatically take text descriptions, right, and formalize problems. And maybe they're not perfect, right, uh, but they're 95% of the work, right? So I, I think we're breaking down the need to have experts, right, between the end users and the tools. You're seeing that not only in planning, because people have looked at doing that in planning already, and plan, you know, and large language models can formalize uh, uh, languages like PDL, even RGDL, which I've worked on. Um, uh, so they, they can formalize that, but in, in, in the constraints literature, uh, in constraint tools, they, they can take uh, just textual descriptions of constraint problems uh, and uh, formalize uh, them in, in, the, in the language of constraint solvers. Uh, T.S. Booms and K.K. Lupin is doing work on that uh, topic, and it's working. So um, in one way, sort of, we're just thinking about the human interface, right? Now it's not just the other person who uses these tools, but anyone who has a plain problem, right, might be able to speak to the system get to plan, right? And that's pretty cool, just the interface of these tools. Um, but then the second question is, well, what, what about under the hood, right? Can LMs be used under the hood? What I'm amazed about the common sense reasoning for LMs is just how they zero in on the right answer so quickly, right? They know what to do, what to say, how to reason. I wouldn't understand them more. But I do think in terms of knowing, uh, training on lots of existing uh, plans and policies, right? And knowing how to generalize, how to prioritize, Right? Instead of having a search tree in AlphaGo that's huge, right? to have a search tree that's only three or four branches. Right? I do think these technologies will be good at helping you prioritize uh, the uh, decision making uh, in these search systems. Right? Um, and I think in the next year or two, you're going to see a lot of methods that, that are using that and doing very well. So combining sort of planning and learning. All right, I suppose there are many other questions we could uh, ask Scott, but uh, let's do that uh, around uh, the coffee table, okay? So let me finish, and thanks Scott again. Uh, thanks a lot. <laughs>